Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you clearly. You're audible and visible. And you can see the screen as well. We can see the screen. It's full screen. Very nice. Thank you. Yes. Good. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you, Alok, for giving the opportunity to present here. And very important thing is, I'll just a little bit take one minute for yeah, yeah. Because I had a survey linear probe, I, I, and when I first came after your first session, I just thought that I would not be able to because I could see only two windows. But with the uh, uh, settings you told and uh, Sujik also, I, I connected because we had many quite a few conferences as well. I was able with the frequency and and uh, uh, depth you told I, I was able to do it and now in our know, UDC we do it uh, especially with your guidance and I'm very thankful to you. Uh, not at all, not at all. I mean. Uh... We learn from each other, and the sure. beauty of it is you can use any probe with a little bit of adjustment. So please go ahead, sir. Thank you very much. So uh, uh, this was recently when we when I started training. So uh, we had a thirty-five week survey, quite high tier, one point three k, and it was at uh, at uh, when other people passed it. Uh, we thought it was a uh, because we was given antenna steroids and uh, I guess uh, in preoperative we were in here. So after after um, operation, five days, five days in the And then uh, with oral also because it was IUGR. Almost uh, 30, 39 days, I think we were taking uh, and he went home. But uh, within three days of uh, uh, going home, he had to admit it with respiratory distress and oxygen requirement. We initially started CPAP, uh, which he required up to 70% of the CPAP that he was increased to uh, 21%. And then the very important. So at that time, before, as soon as he came, uh, before we did the x ray, uh, because I was learning the ultrasound, my clinical two differential diagnoses were either uh, post operative leak, which is a little bit yep. unusual after 30 days of life, but then we always had that because it was very tight uh, and estomosis. And second thing is the aspiration uh, pneumonia because these babies, when the stomach is pulled up, they have quite a bad discussion as well. So, so when we put the, because I'm going, from the normal one, and then yep. on the left side, when we put was almost like a normal one, and I could see good A lines and yep. no bad or no nothing at all. And then I started scanning, especially right upper lobes, and I could see the difference uh, as well. There were uh, some B lines there as well, there were some crumbs there, there were some around pleura, there were white spots. I think, is it the set sign? It's a little bit tricky to say. Uh... Yeah, here oh, definitely. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. definitely there. That is a consolidation with potential for shred sign. Yep. Okay, so these two, uh, we thought that it was the right upper pneumonia, but as, as you have told and we had present, I have told you, uh, so we had at least for a year or two, we will regulate um, with the x rays as well as the schedule with the brain. All, all of them will go for training. Yes. So, what we did, we can. Uh, very good. The it showed the right upper uh, pneumonia as well. Uh, and then uh, afterwards, uh, uh, we did uh, just to rule out because again, actually, what happened is once he came on 21%, and we were we again established on two over three feet. Again, after a week, he had uh, one more uh, aspiration episode on the feet of 40. So then we we, we got the we, he was already on anti treatment, but then we got the thickener as well. Little bit difficult to get it here, but we got it from uh, outside and then we went on to our uh, And then we, we, because we just wanted to block that, there is nothing else except uh, reflux. So we went for barium as well, uh, CT solid CT scan of products with oral uh, barium as well. And then we showed massive immediate reflux and there was no evidence of the occurrence of it. Mm. So now he has went home on, uh, uh, because now we don't want to take chance till 2.5 kg, so he has went home on NGP. Uh, and on our 
yes, we are on the data. So that was my first. Question. So can we go back to your images because they're very nice. Yes. So again, just to highlight that, I mean, what we're using here is a curvilinear probe, very good sector width. I mean, you've got good delineation of the pleura, which is visible over here, and then a very nice kind of an A profile. Uh, I mean, it's as good as I would say any image that you'd get with the linear probe. And then when you go to the next image, you have this area here that has what is a B profile, pleura, and this area is definitely consolidated. Question is whether those are slight static air bronchograms that you see over there. So definitely a consolidation. Uh, assuming this is the right upper zone, this is the highest zone. So it's right, really right epical with a very clear... Now, one of the things that's really, really important to kind of talk about in this image is we would also call this a double lung point. And again, it's to say that a lot of people talk about the fact that double lung points are pathognomonic of transient tachypnea of newborn, they aren't. Actually, what they represent is an area of clear transition where you will see an A profile alternating with what might be a B profile, what might be consolidation with a B profile, or just a simple profile where there is more than three B lines per intercostal space. Again, the underlying history and the clinical correlation, as you very nicely described, sir, gives us that information to kind of suspect that this may well be a mnemonic presentation, maybe an aspiration pneumonia, maybe infection, a little bit late postoperatively to have it. And then the next image, again, uh, if we could just have a look, it's this is a very nice fractal sign. So you've lost pleura there and you've got irregularity to it. Putting Doppler there sometimes can be helpful. But the other thing that uh, is is really helpful in this particular situation, especially if you want to kind of differentiate atelectasis, is usually atelectasis is very geometrical. And this is not geometrical at all. This has got a very irregular broken edge to it. So for me, it would favor a fractal sign. Again, in an area that has really a, a very dominant B profile, no A lines, you've got some areas of horizontal, I would say, most probably static bronchograms, a few areas that I, I suspect would have been static bronchograms, but you know, your image quality, even with this probe is it's beautiful. Uh, you know, I, I would not get better images myself. So I think what you've clearly demonstrated, sir, is that you can actually use uh, a sector probe very nicely. Uh, you've got good depth as well. You know, if you look at that, you're going up to about 3.7 centimeters and you're getting a very nice large area of your lung. So, my compliments, sir. Thank you, God Thank bless you, you for your guidance. Actually, I was so dejected that we couldn't because this uh, M thermo for me and for me are using. They are now not they open with the new new one, and they, I couldn't get the uh, stick probe. And I thought I will now do one new one, which is not easy. So soon to buy. So, but then you you just suggested, and I, I got got the good reviews, and then I got confident myself that uh, I started. The only thing which I have, I just wanted to ask you is that because we are getting only two reads windows, uh, so uh, what I am doing is on in each zone uh, rather than doing six, we are doing twelve. So in each zone, fine. we are doing two readings. That's that's, that's absolutely fine. And really, what I'd say is, you know, if you had a smaller probe, it would be even more difficult. So that's absolutely fine because it's giving you the image interpretation with clinical correlation and you're covering the entire geography of the lung. It's not a okay. problem at all. Thank you. So I'll go to my second question. Uh, so this again, again, I will just, because always when 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 we learn any new, new uh, procedure or any new techniques of like ultrasound, like when we learn it, now we learn we always try to clearly uh, correlate clinically and this what I, I would just then I would uh, do the conclusion but what happened with this case gradually because we are attending all the lectures so what happens first what what used to happen in our unit is whenever we we find any premature release on, on more than around that's what the cl uh, clinical uh, flow chart of uh, surfactant view was and anybody who was on sick have more than 40 percent and we used to give the surfactant so this case highlights that what little bit I have learned, although people are now, we are correlating with x-rays and people are now understanding it and we will take time uh, to, to, to consolidate on the uh, this technique of the better. But I'll just show you what happened in this case. So we 
had a tweens 33 plus 2 week uh, the lcs was going to be put from probably around 13 to 14 hours no antenatal steroids were given uh, so the admit both were admitted with tachypnea and low uh, low fructose when during the transfer because we don't have in-house uh, it is a private so all we go for all the other kind of uh, hospitals and we get the baby so this was one idea so we got all both the babies on local oxygen and now it was we initially so i'll just sorry first we'll just look at the scan so this was the uh, first uh, the scans which we did on on the female uh, the twin one female uh, the child so this was the posterior uh, uh, this is a posterior so i could see the pleura is there uh, the sliding was there i could go out take on the video and i could see some relaxed uh, uh, are there. Nah, no A lines would be visible. Yep. And here also the C lines are there. Uh, and this is again the posterior. Method. And the lateral, uh, like some, sometimes lateral, sometimes uh, in posterior, we find there are some difference. Here, the, it's like more confluent. Uh, yep, absolutely. Like AIS. And yep. that's the left. Yeah, like AIS. And then left later also. Uh, and in, now, surprisingly, in anterior zone on the right side, I could see some A lines as well. So, uh, and the pleura is also there. Uh, so, these B lines are not that uh, similar to the left side. Uh, as well, again, here also, I could see some A lines as there. So, in this, uh, because we were, we were also, all, always comparing with other twins, so I will just focus on that case as well. So, twin brother was there. So, this I'm I'm expecting and I will tell what difference was there. So here, uh, sorry, this this same baby. I'm just concluding what happened clinically. Yeah, so sure. Started on FHF, FHF, uh, high uh, uh, high flow nasal cannula. What we do in uh, in, in, in around about 28 we then go for HFNC and then below 28 we go for CPAP. So we started mm -hmm. HFNC and up to 25 percent FI to required, but then. Uh, because of the some A lines which I could see on the uh, right side, uh, I I thought we will just withhold uh, at present just to see whether that's the another thing which we can improve in our unit because uh, we were using surfactant between 35 to 40 percent. So we I just withhold the surfactant. Uh, we gave it to boy. I'll just show you that because we had a bad confirmed uh, lines. But here technically settled and the baby actually was out of a uh, high. Uh, HFNC in three days and we did not require perfect and it was different from his twin, twin, uh, twin brother so this Very is the nice. same uh, the 33 plus two week male uh, he, he was uh, twin two and developed as we did he commenced on HFNC now this uh, after that lecture also we, we because we always uh, uh, reflect back all the lectures so we uh, is that uh, that question I wanted to ask I think it's my last last week only Marco was there that uh, how how do we decide about after lung ultrasound after delivery? So rather than uh, looking at the cause, if we get the confluent B lines, then we can start HFNC or respiratory support, anything, any respiratory support. And then gradually the cause will find out either it might come out to be bad TTN or RDS or this. So we always comment on uh, HFNC if there is a, a such a baby as well. So we come yeah. and but this this. The uh, ultrasound was extremely different. I could, I it was almost like a full B lines. I couldn't see any uh, thing. So this was a total white out like uh, picture. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah, kind of white lung. Different. Once you've seen white all the zones, you, yeah, white lung. Yep. So right lower zone also same thing. Right yep. Zone. Oh yes. Right middle zone also. Same yep. Thing. And uh, right left also upper zone was. Uh, so this was like a lot of concerned B lines or so also now we are going to learn we are learning about the RDS score but at present I could only see from this that that this child was more sicker than the female. So mm -hmm. uh, we and, and technically also we went on up to seventy percent then we gave the satisfaction to this child. But uh, that we, between these two before I was doing the ultrasound scan even the X rays were although this one was uh, quite a white out the female also had some white out and then so previously we were giving surfactant in such babies but at, lately i have at least two to three surfactant we have uh, we have saved uh, by doing ultrasound and now uh, other colleagues are also a little bit coming into the picture that mm -hmm. we can but it will take time for us no 
no, uh, absolutely, sir. And I'm going to talk about that today because naturally for all of us who are practicing lung ultrasound, there are elements of people who disbelieve. And the key question is, these sometimes raise governance concerns. And that's what I'll be speaking in detail about. Sir, can we just go back to your images for the second twin? Because they're beautiful. So again, what you can see is you've got a very nice footprint there with the pleura. And what is, I would say, you know, AIS kind of picture, once you kind of have it in more than three zones, it basically becomes white lung. Now, it's really important in situations like this, like we can't demonstrate subplural consolidations here at the moment, but uh, was this done quite early? Maybe about an hour or two of age? Yeah. 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 So yeah. in those situations, yeah. sometimes subplural consolidations have not quite appeared. Uh, there's an element of fluid confounding, and that's why clinical correlation is very key. Now, my question is, what frequency were you using, sir? Yeah. This, uh, six, uh, six, seven point two, probably seven. You told no around. Yeah. Around six, so seven. that's that's beautiful, uh, and naturally, that's you probably the highest frequency that you can use with the probe at the moment. Is that the case? So, Can you yeah, use? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. The, I mean, like I said, you, at this particular point, you're demonstrating AS, but if you go to the next image, you know, the pleura is very thick, uh, very blurred. And normally what I'd say is, again, I'm just looking at the density of the uh, the kind of pleural layer here. And the question is whether you'd have an element of subpleural consolidations there which naturally are difficult to see because the frequency that we're using is giving us good depth penetration. I think my gut feeling is you'd probably, if you'd used a higher frequency, being able to see them. So this, for me, would fit with a diagnosis of RDS at this particular point from your clinical correlation. And again, it just goes to show that diamniotic twins. Yeah. So dichorionic diamniotic, you know, the, the environment for one twin may be quite different to the environment from the other twin. Uh, the other twin, I'm just curious, was he stressed smaller, the first twin? Or... No, no. What we thought was that this was a history, a history had a leak, probably. Sure, yeah. sure. Very nice. I mean, beautiful images. Nothing that I would change about it, sir. Uh, you know, my compliments and God bless you for, you know, taking it forwards and sharing these yes, these cases with us. Okay, and uh, one last thing is Please. Uh, uh, that how it has helped is that see here, uh, compared to UK where I have here, we see a lot of uh, early onset pneumonia as well yep. uh, with this prolonged after. So what would have happened is uh, that because even with pneumonia also we go for more than 40% on CFAP or CFAP. Then we had a very low set to reduce our set number. So I'm now now thinking that with this uh, uh, more modality, what we learn as well, that I would be able to, and I could see in last uh, two, two to three weeks, almost two to three percent. And we, uh, that's not the aim that we should not give, but we have almost not uh, given, which was not necessary. So that's sure. what I think I could expect from uh, but So just summarizing, as if you have started in the ultrasound, but still it will take one or two. For everybody, for your board, we are correlating with chest X-ray with lateral surface. Get confident. I am. I'm. No, I. I know you. Do overhand only because still whatever will become confident. It's just the start of the long Thank you. My pleasure, sir. God bless you. I'm really grateful. Uh, we have uh, Surjit. Surjit, you want to share some cases today? Yes, Dr. Anup. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Very nice, Dr. Surjit. So, it's visible, just need to go to full screen. Beautiful.
visible uh, dr surjit uh... yeah hello hello yeah. starting so this was a term uh, ha baby with the birth asphyxia and the baby had sepsis and baby actually presented to me uh, around on 19th or 20th day of life uh, and uh, uh, that neonate was admitted in some other hospital and was on ventilator almost for 15 to 20 days over there Ooh. and uh, in the summary we got to know that there was history of uh, um, pulmonary hemorrhage also for that baby so this uh, ultrasound was done on day 23 of life So these were few of the images which I found. Yep. So here we can see the uh, ribs yep. and uh, uh, the bat wing sign is seen. Uh, the pleural sliding is present and we can see a uh, few A lines, but there are a few B lines also. Yep. Uh, and uh, with that... There is an area of shred sign. I can see a shred sign over here. Yes, ma'am. And... You're absolutely right. It's beautiful. It's not good for the baby, but it's beautiful. Yeah. I don't know. Very nice so... images, ma'am. Very good depth penetration. So this is area of shred sign. And we can see a few bronchograms. Yep. And the next slide... This is another picture. It's a huge red sign in that zone. Yeah. Yeah. This is again on another area. This is the third area. So there is again uh, pneumonia on the third area also. So I suspect it was a ven ventilator associated pneumonia as baby was so many days on ventilator. So this baby had come. I think one week or 10 days back and he's better now. Yeah. And he's improving. I'm planning what was the CRP, ma'am? CRP was also high, sir. Maybe around 60, 70, mm -hmm. something like that. And the platelets were also a little low. Yep. Very nice images, ma'am. Good depth penetration. Very nice, uh, I would say, uh, you know, demonstration of the anatomy. Uh, you can clearly see very good shred sign as well. Very good, ma'am. Nothing to add. Initially, initially did you put I used to on? do. Sorry. Dopplers. Uh, no, 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 no. I have not. Okay, I should have put. So we we will be seeing more of vascular markings, like. Uh, you may or may area. not. Uh, like area. if it's an acute phase, you might not see the redistribution of blood flow to those areas, but no doubt this would still be a shred sign considering the clinical history. Uh, you can get shred sign after pulmonary hemorrhage, but this is very patchy. And usually shred sign after pulmonary hemorrhage is quite, I would say, low bar. Uh, this for me would be very consistent with infection, demonstrating a you know a significant patchiness to it. You've got static air bronchograms as well. And again, post pulmonary hemorrhage, you don't usually see a lot of static air bronchograms. You see lung destruction giving a shred sign. So the static air bronchograms would go more in favor of a mnemonic kind of a consolidation. So if Initially, you have, I used to do with a depth of 2.6, but now I'm taking up to 3.1. Yep. And you're getting very good depth. You know, I can make out very nicely. So very good images, ma'am. Nothing to add to it. Have you got another case? Yeah, extensive. Yeah. Ooh. Oh, dear. So this is another baby. Uh, it was a late preterm. Again, had birth asphyxia and uh, was HI stage 2. Had sepsis and was on mechanical ventilator. And uh, this uh, lung ultrasound was done on day 6 of life. Baby was on ventilator for the pre initial six days. 
So baby is still on ventilator and uh, this was a picture on day six. Yep. So this again here, the batwing sign is seen, the pleural sliding is present. Here, uh, the depth is only 2.6. Maybe I actually decreased the depth because I wanted to see the superficial areas. Yep. So, um, and the B profile is seen. And again here, I can see consolidation with the shred sign and yep. uh, bronchograms. And so... It's a beautiful image. Uh, you've definitely got extensive shred sign. Now, the, the question that I ask is, again, is there an element of lung here that could be recruited? Is your baby tubed and ventilated? Yes, yes. Okay. So, even with a kind of a mnemonic kind of clinical presentation with shred sign, you have these linear uh, bronchograms. We're going to talk about it more on Sunday that you can see here. And these usually, these static air bronchograms that are linear, they sometimes represent lung that can be recruited. So if you're struggling with ventilation, if you're not struggling, again, clinical correlation is key, but this may well be an area of lung that you could recruit. Uh, is this the posterior part of the lung? Yes, probably. Yeah. Yes. Okay. But yeah, so very... different areas. Yep. Very nice yeah. images. Can you look are at... Are these static, uh, static bronchograms? Uh, yes, ma'am. These are static bronchograms. Basically, you have shred sign. The question is, do you have an element of atelectasis as well? Because I don't see established pleura at the top. Or is this just pleura that's been destroyed? And what would give you this information is like if you put the pressures up a little bit and you repeat the ultrasound again in about an hour. And if you start seeing established pleural line, then you can be confident this is atelectasis. But if this remains irregular, non-recruitable, and here I'm not really confident that I can see linear air bronchograms, then this would really be shred sign, mnemonic kind of consolidation. Again, with atelectasis, we said that in the area of atelectasis, where the lung is completely atelectasic, you're not going to see blood vessels within that region. So again, using Doppler here, is really helpful. For me, again, the clinical history would be very important. So the CRP, uh, what you might be growing on ET secretions or blood cultures? Yeah, CRP was almost 115 for this mm. baby. Had yep. an early onset sepsis. So this linear uh, bronchograms indicate what? Also? So they may indicate recruitability. We'll talk about okay. it on Sunday. Okay. So, I, you know, with atelectasis in particular, when you have an area of atelectasis that's quite large, you'll have consolidation below it, usually confluent with it. And if you have linear air bronchograms, it usually indicates that that might be recruitable lung. And that basically comes from a study that's called the Luster study, which we'll talk about on Sunday. Okay, there's just one more case which I actually wanted to discuss. Sure. This is, I think, yeah, this one. So this is actually an old case which I had done uh, before I had joined your course. Hmm. So still I wanted to discuss a few yeah, things sure. regarding this. This is a, this was a late uh, preterm and uh, 35 weeks uh, gestation had hydrops petalis was a case of hydrops and had pleural effusion and ascites antenatally also uh, in antenatal scan antenatal scans so uh, when i put my probe mm -hmm. on the chest this is what i had found yeah this was an old pictures which i had saved so uh, the battling sign is present i can't uh, see the pleural line over here but, and uh, even here, I could I can see only in between somewhere like bit of pleural line. So um, and there's a B profile. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is this like? What can we call this, this as is an effusion? Uh, and this is causing compressive atelectasis of the lung. Here, okay, yeah, this is the dark area. Atelectasis. Yeah, this is compressive atelectasis. And actually, what you're finding is so if I just draw out, that is basically effusion. It's you know. Uh, and during expiration, if you just play it again, the lung collapses.
so really what you've got is you've got a fusion over here as well so this this is basically lung that you see over here uh, you've got a lot of consolidation. You've got an element of static air bronchograms and then basically a B profile. This is all a B profile that you see. So it's compressive atelectasis. Uh, in terms of the kind of background history for this baby, uh, I mean, ooh, it, it, the lung basically being compressed with significant consolidation at this particular point may not necessarily give you an idea about etiology. But yeah, what it does say is that you've got a pleural effusion. And if you find it confusing, because normally what we expect is we expect pleural effusions to kind of be uniform, there be uniform atelectasis, not always the case, because you might have underlying pathology in the lung itself that is causing the lung to become atelectatic and abnormal. Uh, again, with this kind of a B profile and those static air bronchograms, you do worry about the potential of infective process as well. So, I mean, what, I'd be very curious to know what the clinical course is. And was yeah. this... Uh, yeah. sir, uh, I, I actually even wanted to know where exactly when we see that... I'll show you another picture. This was another uh, area. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I'm not very sure we should keep this probe like this, the way we otherwise keep for uh, our routine lung ultrasound scans. Or it should be kept in like uh, lower lateral uh, area. Like the way we tell that the fluid settles down. So there, How do we actually keep the probe? And there is a whole session that we do. It's the second last session that we'll do. So can you see me? Yes, yes, yeah. Okay, so this, you need a comprehensive scan in this situation. You have to scan all regions. What I'd say is that you'd start with scanning that is perpendicular. And then really what I'd say is you need to quantify the site of the largest pleural effusion. And really... To, to quantify, you have to go in the mid and posterior axillary lines, doing, I would say, transverse probes uh, in each area so that you can look at the, the area of maximum pocket. Now, normally that will be in the fifth and sixth space and you want to locate the liver and liver can actually be quite low if you have a very large effusion. So when you're doing a comprehensive scan for effusions, the, the, the scans that are longitudinal are diagnostic scans. And you might find that the plural effusion, even if it's large, is quite small based on the distance between visceral and parietal pleura anteriorly, but increases as you go to the mid axillary line, posterior axillary line. But as you go down, when you do your transverse scans in each plane, you're able to identify the maximum pocket. And that is basically how you decide where you're going to put your pigtail or chest train. Here, you've got a very uniform picture, uh, basically a very large effusion, which is causing uniform compressive atelectasis of the lung with what is just a, a dominant B profile with whiteout lung. So if you put an M mode on, you'll get a very nice sinusoidal sign. The fact that it's so uniform on this side and very irregular on the other side is, you know, it's concerning because it just worries you that there's something that's wrong with the opposite lung. So did you tap this baby? Yes. Like I could see these pictures, this view in almost all the areas. Yeah, And you can see and it gets I larger. Tapped, yeah. yeah, it was larger. And so when I tapped this somehow, I remember, but I couldn't capture, capture the videos. Immediately after tapping, when I did a lung ultrasound, this whole thing, uh, this whole effusion had disappeared. Yep. And the uh, B profile turned into A profile. Absolutely A profile with no B lines. And that is immediately after tapping. On both sides? On the both the sides. And it, we, I could see very good A lines with no such consolidated areas. And a very good, like, lung. It's a acid. very nice case, ma'am. Then what it indicates is that this profile is not because there is a primary pathology with the lung. It's because you have compressive atelectasis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very nice case. And again... Is this the ideal view, which... We're not supposed to take such views, right? Like... No, no, uh, no. Like, uh, the one so which you, you showed in the uh, uh, axillary lower area... And uh, where we can see the diaphragm and the liver and the effusion. So that, if you go lower down, your transverse in the midline here. Uh, no, no, you're longitudinal because you have multiple rib spaces with a batwing sign. Uh, 
So normally what I do is I would do exactly the standard protocol of having R1, R2, R3, R4. I would do all my longitudinal scans. And as you come lower down, depending on how much fluid there is, when you kind of look at, I would say, R3, R4, it's usually the R4 and the L4 regions where you'll get the, the, the collapsed lung with what is generally called the jellyfish sign because you can actually see the, the, the distal end of the lung. Here, you're in the middle. My gut feeling is probably an anterior zone or a lateral zone, but higher up. So you can't actually see the jellyfish sign. But what you're classically seeing at this particular point is uh, pleural fluid causing compressive atelectasis. Again, my feeling is this is probably an anterior scan because I can't see the spine either. I can't see spine sign. So I think your probe is anterior, but yes. it's basically showing compressive atelectasis. And the fact that you've drained and it's become an A-profile then means that actually there's no primary pathology in the lung. This is predominantly fluid causing atelectasis. I mean, few things about the fluid here. It is not echogenic fluid. It is uh, very uniform. I cannot see any fibrin strands in it. Uh, it would favor a transudate uh, as opposed to an exudate, but it is not definitive. And the only way that you can really differentiate is by formally doing a tap. So what was the color of your tap, ma'am? Fluid. It was light yellow. Light yeah. yellow. Serious kind of. Yeah, serious. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. But so beautiful what images. I could have done, yeah. put a M mode for the sinusoidal. Yeah. I could have taken an axillary lower area to see that jellyfish sign, which I didn't do. And for for drainage, when you're wanting to put a drain in, ma'am, there's a there's a protocol that we follow, which is basically doing transfer scans in the mid and posterior axillary lines to identify the maximum pocket. Once we identify the maximum pocket. Uh, depending on which procedure you're using. So if you're putting in a trocar drain in, we don't use the trocar. It's uh, incision, drainage, and insertion of the drain with basically an artery forceps. Now that is very difficult to see on ultrasound. But actually, if you are doing just needle drainage with a butterfly and you keep the angle of the needle uh, perpendicular to the probe, you can actually see the, the needle penetrating. If it's in the direction of the probe, you won't be able to see it. So it's you can use ultrasound for actual diag diagnostic paracentesis. Now, if you're using a cannula, again, you'll be able to see the tip of the needle. And I'll show you how to do it. But once the needle comes out, it's very difficult to then visualize anything. So our second last talk, we will cover all of this. But these are beautiful images, ma'am. Thank you, sir. That's it. Got it. Very nice case. We've got Dr. Ashraf. May I share my screen? Yes, sir. Very nice cases today. And again, the clinical correlation history is very important. So rushing into uh, thinking that there might be a primary problem with the lung, but then getting that retrospective history of the lung showing an A profile after you draw the fluid really fits more with a kind of a, uh, a pleural effusion as opposed to a primary lung pathology and a pleural effusion. Go for it, Dr. Ashraf. Uh, hi, hi. Good evening, everyone. I am visible and audible. Yes, sir. Today, I will just do two cases. One of them RDS and the other one it is pneumosaurus. So the brittle, uh, extreme brittle meal neonate, 23 week, emergency lower section section because preeclampsia, born on day uh, April 7, and booked the mother with G2B1, but one, the, the other one born at 26 week and uh, died after 10 days from severe intracranial hemorrhage. Abigail score, it was five, and to beat it in, and they gave him first dose of Cervanta and drift the room and transfer to the uh, in nice view. No material risk factor for sepsis, no asteroid or magnesium sulfate. We put in dress uh, control AC mode with volume guarantee. Lung ultrasound done 10 hours of, of age to do lung ultrasound score and if needed, the second dose of sepsis or not. The X-ray on admission, 
which is reticulation and granulation, mm. uh, gra ground appearance and reticulation. Mm. This is the first one, the R1, R2. It is uh, this is uh, a no rip shadow. This is Bolura, face micro consolidation. Yep. White lung here. And there's also the uh, right lateral, three and four. This is micro consolidation of normal plural line, white lung. Here by, Taban, uh, I use a uh, linear probe 12. Here, uh, the, the physical ray 12 also for the echo, cardiac echo. It is also white lung, white lung. Here, the vestibular segment, the vestibular lung also uh, consolidation. Go to the left side, it is uh, the same. It is uh, ribs, no rib shadow, white lung. Fibrous lining, but it's very snowflake appearance. Yep. Also, the rare uh, AIS with snowflake appearance. Also, here in the, the fish array, fish array, also this one. I did the score. Uh, Lung art and down the score here uh, two and two in the anterior uh, segment. In lateral V deep consolidation here it gets three. If I write seven, a left two uh, four and two lateral total uh, six, total thirteen. I give the second dose of servant. Beautiful images, sir. I uh, this is a score. We did it before. This is four. This is three, it's seven, yep. two and two, uh, four and two, six, or total 13. Uh, yep. Really, today, now the, the four day of age, the baby. I today make an imaging to see what the pastoral segment. I found this image. The red pastoral, five to six. Mm. It is, uh, see, consider, uh, uh, Yep. The same left side. Same the latter, right latter is the same. Yep. It is, at this time, it was in volume guarantee 5 per kg, and 2.5 total. I increased the volume guarantee to be 6 and 3, and little bit, the baby was 6.5 and make it 7.5. Yep. And this image after uh, four hour Recruitment maneuver, is, yep. Uh, recruit, yeah. Yeah. It is transferred from the C profile to B profile. Very nice, sir. So again, uh, if you look at right posterior five and six, there are lots of these small linear uh, yeah. static uh, yes, air yes. bronchograms. And that is a sign that this might be a recruitable lung. So by increasing the pressures and repeating the scan, you've demonstrated recruitability very nicely, sir. Beautiful. It's also interesting, uh, you know, the, the profile can sometimes and change. Sometimes. But here, the profile actually remains really what I'd say is a compact B profile in the R5-6 regions, but a dominant, I would say, AIS kind of a pattern in the R lateral 3 and 4 regions. So, very nice images. Is it the first cases? I will stop here and get another one. Sure, please. Is visible and double now? Uh, yes, yeah. This is uh, cases of pneumothorax. It is uh, early term uh, female neonate, 37 week, emergency S because the labor. Mother is 3 years old, uh, graphed uh, 5 by 4, angular score was 9 and 10, with 2.9, transfer to nursery for care after 3 hours later, develop the kidney with chest traction. And not in ICU. Unless we do at this time uh, 93 or 9 fre high frequency, high frequency camera, flow 5 and the FI2 is uh, 0.3. Blood gas is also normal at this time. Point of kill address done after seven, uh, seven hours after delivery. 
this is the X ray. They, they, they cannot uh, rely this is pneumothorax or not. With the, uh, some area of velocity here. Yep. This is, uh, I, I doubt from this pneumothorax or not. I make it right set up. But nothing deleted something. The, even the, 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 the report from the radiology, this is only right deep sign, uh, circle sign, and maybe yep. like this, this. Maybe suggest of pneumothorax. When I do the scan, Here, this is the no 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 line sliding. Feel here right border feel line sliding. This is barcode mood barcode sign. Here lung point here. This is lung sliding no line sliding. This is lung point it's here. It is this is horizontal scan the vertical scan the same barcode sign with no line sliding. To compare with the left side, this is. Uh, Lung sliding, a profile, a, a, a brain profile. This is Sandy Beach, this is uh, barcode. Here, the uh, lung point here. This lung sliding and no sliding for the lung point. No lung sliding here. Feel lung sliding here. This is uh, the one, uh, this one. Yep. In comparison to the bad lung sliding, this is left lung, normal lung sliding. Here, no lung sliding. This is the right lung, the pistero bar. I go to the internal zone, the same. Feel the uh, lung point. This lung here, yeah. Feel no lung here, feel track sign, mirror image. A, a, prime, a prime profile, also the internal zone. No lung sliding, the track signs, a, a, a dash profile. This is lateral view, normal. Lateral, uh, right lateral. This is with the M mood. Here, the uh, no lung sliding and lung sliding. Barcode, the sandy beach, is the lung point, is the one. El, el, also, the anterior lower segment, right, anterior part of the field is uh, not, no, uh, no, no sliding. Here, barcode. Usually, yani, by sonar, it is maybe moderate or severe. Uh, maybe calm, على high flow, uh, sterilator. I even I, I off the high flow, put it in prone position, on right side, uh, right side. In ambient, second day, this baby is okay. Two days later, charge him. Lovely images, sir. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Depth is beautiful and such nice M mode. You've got a, a very good skill, sir. I'm uh, you, really sir. grateful, sir, for, for sharing. So can I take your opinion for one, one case? I, last month, I, I presented one, so 23 week also. It is all, it's good. And even to reach to 27 day, 27 week from 24, full fed ABM feeding, uh, suddenly uh, apnea. I make the septic work up to those candida gilberta. I did the echo, the focal endocarditis of a start antifungal. Two days later, the follow up severe hyponatremia, whose sodium it was uh, 117, was bratelet, I think in 25 of the bratelet. Ultrasound, this is. Uh, meningitis. Neck, la la, not meningitis. Okay. Neck, yeah. Mm. Uh, I, I share the cerebral surgeon, he follow up and, and need, till now no need for the for the intervention surgically. After two days, after the sound, there is no uh, malgated uh, intestine. He go to the surgeon, it's open. He cannot do anything because yeah. the intestine amalgated everything. So I really, I, I you now, palliative care. Hmm. I dream to to make, give him in the uh, TBN till one year, to one year old. I can looking for the transplant. You facing like this before? So uh, over here in the UA, we don't have the facility. Uh, what I'd say is that if it's complete NEC to salis, uh, and you have no intestine, then the prognosis of getting a baby through 
in that situation because you'll probably develop end stage liver disease with TPN by the time he's ready to have a bowel transplant the prognosis is extremely poor experience says that the only center in the UK that takes babies like this uh, and again prognostically really it involves multidisciplinary care with our hepatologist as well as uh, I would say our, our nutrition team uh, and then prognostication is really when they have an element of bowel left and what our surgeons usually try and do is quantify and see. Uh, they give us a rough figure of 12 to 15 centimeters of bowel being present. Those are kind of babies who we would look at potentially for a bowel transplant. But if it's complete loss of the entire intestine, small bowel completely gone, uh, large bowel completely gone, then the prognosis and the, the kind of... Uh, most of those kind of babies, I know Birmingham would usually refuse in the UK. So it's a it's a it's a difficult one. Uh, are you really having about... twenty four reached to even almost thirty one week? They follow like this. It is really first time. First is... time to face this. Yeah, and just um, before the one loop, second two loop, gangrene, they make a uh, list to me, which is what this is totally interesting. Uh, yeah. list. We've seen quite a few cases when I was in Southampton. And uh, normally in those situations, we would move towards palliative care and stop intensive care. Uh, for babies who do have an element of gut, we then try them on TPN and we'd have really multidisciplinary care. We'd really look at how the liver manages uh, and they would transition really, across. And, and, uh, my, you, my question, you can go from stage 2B to... Uh, to uh, within to, hours... To within hours so, so like this consideration yep yeah, yeah, absolutely mm -hmm. we've seen it happen within hours where we've had a baby who's been completely well uh who's deteriorated i remember a baby with just gi bleeding uh who within a period of about 12 hours we opened up and had complete nec totalis there was no viable gut left so it can be quite fulminant the question is really from our perspective it's it's often silent nec where we we've had an element of vascular ischemia. So it's the ischemic component of NEC there that's really causing the major amount of the damage as opposed to the necrosis that you sometimes see with the infective component. And uh, often those babies, commonly, they might clot off the superior inferior mesenteric arteries completely. They have an element of vasculitis and we know that it's multifactorial. So those kind of acute deteriorations tend to have a bigger vascular element as opposed to the necrotic element. So we've seen quite a few cases like that. The, the strange exchange for this case is the patient when the woman operated, it is perforated. There is no air, all, all time, the x-rays, there is no air in, in, in under the frame. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's one of those, like I said, it's vascular ischemia. So you've lost your whole bowel. Often it's dark yeah. black bowel that comes out. Nothing is viable. So, yeah. you know, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a short gist of uh, a talk today. So I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. Is it visible to everybody? Yes, visible. Okay, okay. Yes. thank you. So what I'm going to talk about today is really best practice in lung ultrasound and really the important aspects of how we want to implement lung ultrasound going forwards. All of you have now, I, I'd say, reached a level where you're very confident with your probes. I mean, some of you come with a huge amount of experience, some more than even me. So, you know, that's to be respected. Uh, some of you have shown rapid progress. And really, you know, uh, for some of you, you've kind of transformed into uh, really good uh, clinicians who are able to interpret lung ultrasound in a really effective way. I think what we're trying to cover in this talk is how you are going to take some of the elements of training or your pre-existing skills that you've demonstrated here forwards in a manner that allows you to implement lung ultrasound safely 
with a governance framework. Now, that is obviously done through a process that usually involves us having standards for training, standards for credentialing, standards for assessment of our scans and quality assurance, but more importantly, standards that basically say that we're using the same language, reporting skills, so that we can ensure that we have a, a consistent quality of scans. But more importantly, when things go wrong, that we can address the pitfalls of lung ultrasound in a manner that keeps us safe, because there are medical legal implications of working outside our limitations. And lung ultrasound has its fallibility, you know, that can sometimes make things a little bit challenging. But more importantly, uh, what we also know is that no diagnostic modality is without uh, the, you know, the, the possibility of medical error, of diagnostic error. And really, if we are doing lung ultrasound in a structured way, in a manner that we have a guideline for, we're talking the same language, then really we mitigate a large amount of this error. There will, however, be situations where there are circumstances beyond our control that result in medical error. And the question is, how do we address that? So before I talk of that, I want to show you all a video. So this is a baby. It's a 33-weeker on Optiflow. Now, it's a baby who is suddenly deteriorating uh, where I'm doing some translumination. It's obviously gone up in its oxygen requirements. It's got significant work of breathing. And what I'd like to kind of show you is translumination. And the reason I'm showing you this video is to show you how subtle translumination can be. So this is the left side. That's the right side. Well, can't see much there. Or you can just about see a small rim of air. Now, the reason I'm showing you this video is because I've got the lights turned off here completely. I mean, this is a dark room. And in a dark room with, uh, I would say, a really good translumination device, I've got really subtle amount of air that's visible on that right side that you can see when the baby cries. Now, if you actually think that this baby might have a pneumothorax and you're using clinical signs, but you do that in a room that's completely lit, you might actually miss this. And really, that's where, you know, there's potential that you might miss a clinical diagnosis of a pneumothorax while it's evolving and getting worse, where if somebody comes back to kind of talking about, well, what have you done clinically? You'll say, well, I've done illuminated and it's negative. And that may result in a situation where this baby gets worse, eventually gets intubated. And once he has his x-ray and is an extremist and quite sick, you detect that the baby has attention pneumothorax. Now, there's an element of clinical error over here that naturally, from our perspective, we will not retrospectively be able to uh, challenge because we never made the diagnosis of a pneumothorax. We missed it. And what I'd like to emphasize is that if you do not use lung ultrasound properly, there is a real possibility that you can miss very subtle, uh, I would say, manifestations of a pneumothorax or any other pathology on an ultrasound, which may silently get worse. Now, the difference there is you will save your images and those images are open to scrutiny. They're open to peer review, which then from your perspective is important. It's learning. You know, we're not all perfect and we can make those mistakes. But in that situation, the question then is, well, how do we take that forwards in terms of learning for us? What are the governance implications of that? You know, if it's a small pneumothorax that you've missed, that's then become a tension pneumothorax. Uh, there's learning when there's a formative kind of a process in your department. But uh, in certain parts of the world, that process can be quite punitive. And the question from your perspective is really how you manage situations like that. And we'll talk about that. But really what I'd like to first focus on is the initial important aspect of how we implement best practice in lung ultrasound. Because if we're doing it the right way and we're implementing uh, a process that involves structured training, that provides us with a skill that we can then use with a certain standard, with competencies, with the ability to quality assure that competency, then really what we'd be doing is very high quality ultrasound, point of care ultrasound. Now, 
we'd be using that as a diagnostic tool. And with that experience, and as we get more confident, really, we would be able to make a diagnosis of pathology. And if, from our perspective, we're able to do that in a manner that's correct, then really what we open ourselves up is to high quality scanning in which really the need for uh, a governance framework is very important. And the reason for that is occasionally you will have situations where <clears throat> you will land up in uh, the situation that I've just described. And really we need to have a governance framework to address that. Now, if you look at the structure of our course so far, we have been through the didactic training. We have gone through the theoretical aspects of the physiology of lung ultrasound, as well as artifact. We have talked about recognition of the normal lung. We've talked about recognition of the abnormal lung. We've talked about six pathologies in great detail. And actually what we want to be confident about once we finish the course is our ability to diagnose those conditions with the ability to continue doing that on our unit. Now, if you do not have a guideline and a governance framework when you start doing that in the unit and you're the only person who's practicing that, you open yourself up to risk. You open yourself up to questions because naturally there are people who will be doing x-rays on your unit. And we know that lung ultrasound may be more sensitive in being able to pick up pathology, silent atelectasis, occult atelectasis, mnemonic consolidation, fractal sign, all things that you might not necessarily see in an x-ray. And really, you might open yourself up to questions around the decision making if you're using lung ultrasound and somebody else is using x-ray. So why you need to have a guideline and why I have shared our guideline with you is it basically allows you to safely implement your practice with ultrasound whilst you're getting chest x-rays done in those babies as a proxy to start off with while you're gaining confidence in your ability to perform ultrasound. But more importantly, I would say that it's actually a second marker that you're able to demonstrate pathology on lung ultrasound that's not necessarily picked up on X-ray or really X-ray working as, uh, I would say, a gold standard or a second adjunctive method of making a diagnosis to confirm that your lung ultrasound is actually picking up the right things. And you've seen that a lot today where, you know, Dr. Ashraf has shown us some really nice images. So if you have that kind of a framework in place, it just means that you can practice lung ultrasound safely whilst colleagues who don't use lung ultrasound, naturally not everybody, you know, is comfortable using point of care ultrasound. And we need to respect that. We need to respect that in a manner that makes them feel comfortable about our abilities uh, we need to make sure that we we take them along with us. The reason I'm covering this is if you start implementing lung ultrasound in your units, helter-skelter, not taking your colleagues along with it, it just results in a lot of conflict and actually hinders the process of being able to implement uh, lung ultrasound successfully uh, alongside you know, uh, respiratory diagnostic tools that are already being used in particular chest x-ray. I think what I'd say is that all of this needs a period of training. Now, if you look at the competency framework that we've developed, it's based on the AAP recommendations where we talk about training that you've already done. You've, you've done the theoretical element online. You've basically had education as part of a curriculum. Some of you have already got prior experience and have progressed more quickly than others. But really what we now have to do is make sure that whilst you're practicing and doing this on your unit, you're doing this in a manner that allows for standardized documentation for images that can be peer reviewed and validated. But more importantly, that we have standards of storage of reporting that we're using the same terminology so that we can use lung ultrasound in a uniform way. And that's really important. Uh, the reason I say that is that if, if you're performing a lung ultrasound for RDS and you suddenly change the frequency of the probe that you're using between scans before and after, because it's two different individuals doing uh, the scans, you might end up with very different interpretations of how you might want to treat that. Now, that's not going to be good for the baby, but naturally when you peer review and you come up with those kind of scans, you might find that you may have been making different decisions if you'd used the right scan settings or the scan settings that were used by the, you know, the individual either before or after.
more importantly, you need to have a clinical workflow. And a clinical workflow basically means that your images are stored. They are reported within a time frame. Now, this is crucial because actually in, 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 in my setup in the UK, it was mandatory for chest x-rays to be reported within 48 hours of them being done by the pediatric radiologists. But for us, you know, uh, reporting of lung ultrasound could be a week later. Now, that that is a very risky, risky process, because if you have somebody then doing a lung ultrasound and he doesn't have a report, then he doesn't know what interpretation you've made, what your clinical correlation is, why you've taken the decisions you have. But more importantly, that's not there on the radiology system. And that can create a lot of problems in different countries. In particular, in the UK, I know that the standard process is reporting within 48 hours in at least my institution where I used to work. But all this aside, the question is, you've learned how to do lung ultrasound you're doing it on the unit. How are you going to enable colleagues who want to learn uh, to be able to do it as well? You know, once you've got the skill, people will want to learn from you. And the question is, how do you become a safe teacher? Now, there has to be some process of institutional credentialing. And I know for a fact that in the UK, it just does not exist at the moment. Uh, I think that's a real drawback because it just means that Everybody is learning in a different way. Somebody is attending a cactus course. Somebody is attending a music course. Somebody is attending this course. Somebody is attending a face-to-face -face course in Europe, doing two days of kind of didactic training. And suddenly the expectation is that you come to your unit, uh, you pick up the probe and you start scanning without actually having any kind of framework in process. How many scans do you need to do to be accredited? Really, what is the learning curve that says that you can make uh, a safe diagnosis of RDS, TTN, pneumothorax, pleural effusion, pneumonia, collapse, consolidation. How long does it take? How many scans do we need to do? We just don't have any evidence for this. No high quality evidence at all. What we've got is national recommendations. Some say that you can do 30 scans. The ASM guidelines talk about doing 30 scans, 15 of which are normal and 15 of which demonstrate pathology. The British Society of Pediatric Radiology talks about doing 200 scans, which you know is not good for the babies because uh, if you have 10 people doing 200 scans, you'll need to do 2,000 scans to really get everybody trained in the department. I think that's unachievable. Now, having some kind of a framework that your institution feels safe with keeps you safe. And really from our perspective, how do we develop this framework? Well, this framework basically has four aspects to it. So the first aspect is having a guideline that establishes what the indications for lung ultrasound in your unit are. Uh, really standards that establish how you're going to make the diagnosis. And from our perspective, this course, my expectation is that you can diagnose six things by the end of it, which is RDS, TTN, pneumothorax, pleural effusion, collapse, consolidation, pneumonia. And then really a lot of it is an amalgamation of all these pathologies with clinical correlation, which then means we're talking mechorum aspiration, pulmonary hemorrhage. We're talking about potential normal lung, delayed perinatal adaptation, transitional lung. So all of those things defined in this guideline so that you really have the ability to be able to document your reporting in a way that says that these are the diagnostic criteria that the guideline says we use for diagnosis when we're using an ultrasound. While we're learning, we're actually gonna back this up by chest X-ray because where time permits, if we can get a chest X-ray, that helps with diagnosis. It acts as a proxy is the word I would use. But as we get more experienced, what we also understand is lung ultrasound may pick up a lot more than what a chest X-ray actually shows. So it keeps us safe from a number of ways. But in addition to those guidelines, what we need is we need standards. We need standards for documentation reporting, standards for really what and how we would do repeat scans, say if we decide we want to give another dose of surfactant, standards for how we're going to implement our practice with LISA, say, for example. We also need what is a credentialing process. So for anybody who's new, who comes to the unit, some of you may have prior experience. Well, how are we going to approve those credentials so that you can start doing lung ultrasound uh, if you already have the experience? But for those of you who are learning, the question is, when do you become credentialed to be able to do independent reporting to a standard that actually keeps everybody safe, including the babies? 
And then really it's having that clinical workflow. Now I know for a fact that if you're using PAC systems in the UK, you're probably encroaching upon radiological kind of uh, storage. And there's a significant cost factor to it because if you store those images radiologically, uh, you know, a certain number of scans per month adds a significant amount of cost to the, the, the actual storage system. But more importantly, if you do not have a system that stores loops, you can never say whether you have sliding or not. More importantly, you cannot see these images in real time. And that has medical legal consequences. So let's talk about a case. And we have a nice small group today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick out two people. So Naveen, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Lovely. Uh, Naveen, you have Satish as a partner. Satish, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, I look. Okay, so we've got a history here. We've got a preterm 36-week baby who's going for an elective cesarean. Uh, baby is born. Uh, basically, baby had significant respiratory distress, uh, was given kind of peep uh, for about 20 minutes, and really, from our perspective, was kind of left with mum to have some skin to skin with a plan that will review the baby because while whilst the baby had mild tachypnea, he looked pink and well perfused. So at about two hours of age, uh, the SHO went back and reviewed the baby and the baby was clearly grunting, more tachypneic. He put a SATS probe on the right hand and you have SATS of 88% in air. So the baby's been admitted to the neonatal unit at two hours of age. There are no risk factors for sepsis. This was an elective cold section at 36 weeks because the baby is four and a half kilos breech and the mother's gone into labor. This was prior agreement with the mother that she, if, if the mother went into labor and breech, that they'd have an elective cesarean. Uh, she's not been in labor very long for this. So, Naveen. Any gestational diabetes? No, no history of gestational uh, diabetes, no history of PET. She's, this is her first baby, singleton. Uh, and no risk factors for sepsis. No risk factors no for mom sepsis. Is no, she's not had any UTIs. Uh, she's not had a high vaginal swab, but uh, she's not known to be a GBS carrier, no prom, uh, you know, no fever, nothing. And antenatal screening has been pretty straightforward. So yeah, normal antenatal scans. So never needed to repeat them. Fully, you know, normal four chamber heart. Everything was normal on that. So what would you like to do? Few options. So a few means I mean, depends on um, how the baby is. I mean, of course, if the baby is grunting, we can bring observe, keep them for a couple hours. If clinically improves. And get them back to mom if they have the feeds. Sure. Equally, if 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 the baby is working hard, there's some recession, I would just start to put them on CPAP and do an x ray. I mean, of course, we're doing yep. um, with, with the access to lung ultrasound, do a lung ultrasound and see what sure. is. Sure. So at the moment, we're in good nick, uh, but we're in about 40% oxygen. We have significant work of breathing still. And really equal air entry on examination. We've screened, we've started some antibiotics. We've asked the radiographer to come in and it's gonna take her about 35, 40 minutes to get to us. Uh, we've got a gas with a pH of 7.1 uh, and a CO2 of about 8.5 kilopascals, the equivalent of about 60 millimeters of uh, kind of CO2. Uh, Saturations at the moment in about 40, 45% are 95 to 96. So the baby's saturating, but working really hard. So there's time to do a lung ultrasound. So this is the lung ultrasound. So just starting with L1. What do we think? I can see, I can see lung sliding. Very good. Okay, so... Uh, Protocol. Um, we stick to protocol. So, what does protocol say? What should we? So, batwing sign. Yeah, we have two ribs at least. So, yep. batwing sign, and I can see a clear pleura all the way through, with lung sliding. Yeah. And at least um, one half of it. There is some A profile. Very good. And and there is uh, also some B lines, but not coalesced. 
Um, so I would say it's mostly a profile rather than very um, good. Not a P lung. So reasonably well aerated lung, left upper mm -hmm. anterior. Yeah. Okay. Maybe one big B line in the middle, but one, possibly yeah. maybe a double lung point. Possible. Uh, Possible. Maybe, maybe well aerated uh, lung. Maybe that's A lines over here. So, uh, yeah. what about the quality of the scan? So the one, one half uh, actually is quite dark, and so you probably, it's, it's okay. Very good. It's not great. So, again, uh, just a, maybe a truck sign. You can see a mirror image rib there, but relatively mm. confident that you can see prudal sliding. You know, you've got a comet tail coming in there. So, Tool sliding throughout. I would agree with that. Uh, okay. What about L2? Lower down. L2 is so much. We can see uh, probably four rib spaces. Yep. And we can see definitely plural uh, sliding, I think. And yep. a, a profile, essentially. Yep. Okay, I would agree. A few comet tails. Okay. Uh, what about L3? L3 was a real challenge in this baby because this gentleman was very vigorous and very upset. And Dr. Sharma did not take the help of the nurses to e extend the left arm. So you're basically looking at a very fuzzy L3. But what do you think? So, so, so L3, you, you can see Clura clear, but, but at the upper margin, there is an area where potentially um, it's an unclear area with um, air bronchograms. So it's really confusing. So what I'd say is, and this is really important. So the reason I'm showing you this image is you're not linear. You're not at 90 degrees. So because no. you haven't extended the arm, you're losing the upper half of the image. You have plural okay. sliding. Uh, and this is really... Yeah a comet tail over here, but these are A-lines. And the reason they're not very nice is because we haven't done the image very nicely. And you can really make what of, you know, some people would think that's mnemonic in its kind of clinical presentation, but uh, take my word for it, it's not consolidation. The reason I know that is because I've improved on this image. So this is kind of L4, what do we think? Uh, this one, I think again, we can see four rib spaces, parking sign, Lura is quite clean, and, and mm -hmm. um, there is common tail, so you can actually see Lura sliding quite nicely. Yep. A lines all the way through. Yep. So it looks quite elevated. Yep. So the left lung, I mean, if I summarize and say L5 and L6 were similar, exactly the same, yeah. it's relatively well aerated, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe just the left upper zone a little bit wet, but actually anteriorly, but the rest of the lung is very well aerated. Now, naturally, good, yeah. what we should always do is confirm with M mode. And if you look here, I mean, I've got a classical M mode that shows me as he sure sign. Okay, and this is L3. Is there any doubts? Seashore sign, happy? Happy, yeah. Okay, so let's look at R1. Baby's got respiratory distress on CPAP, grunting. Let's see what you think. This one, you've got a, is, is that a, would you call that a mirror image of your crib space? Very good. So, uh, yep. You do. You have a mirror image of the rib space. That's usually associated with pneumothorax or normal lungs is what I remember you saying. Yes? Uh, um, okay. So, but is, is so just, a plural slide? Okay. Least? Very good. So just uh, very important. So it is, if there's no lung sliding, then it is yeah, yeah, associated yeah. with the pneumothorax. But just to be aware, yeah. it can be normally present in well aerated lung as well. And in pneumothorax, yeah, yeah. truck sign is only seen in about 35% of cases in one study. So the question is, is there plural sliding or not? 
that's the bit I'm trying to. Um, I forgot to bring my glasses, but what I can I can't see comma tails here. Mm -hmm. uh, but with a good eye of faith, I think there is plural sliding A lines. Okay. Um, with mirror image. Sure. Okay. Uh, Satish. Could we do, could we do we have the M mode alloc on this? Yeah, okay, we do. I'll show it to you. This is R2. Okay. What do we think? I mean, there's there's truck sign. Yeah. Uh, I'm not convinced that there is a plural sliding. Okay. That's why I think I would like to confirm with the M mode uh, to be certain. Okay, we can do that. So we'll confirm with the M mode. Uh, we'll show you a few more images. This is just another image of R1. Again, uh, total sliding, do we think? Maybe. It's not as clear as on the left side, but, but okay. I don't think it is. I mean, and in the R three, I think uh, I could see definitely some beeline stroke comet tail. So yeah. yes, that goes that goes with the presence of plural sliding. Okay, beautiful. Okay, so let's let's have a look at the M modes. So this is just a comparison side by side again, and this is R one for you. Okay, but slightly lower down. So it's in the middle as opposed to being. It's actually R one R two. So anything? So the M mode is Sandy Beach side. Would it's not typical barcode. My make this up. Okay. There's, there seems to be a transition between the seashore and the barcode, isn't it? Hello. Yeah. Very good. So beautiful. Both of you have done fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So in this image, so if I just highlight to you that really you've got a lung point coming in over here. Yes. And it can be that subtle, just a very subtle lung point. You can see the plural sliding here, no plural sliding here. You've got truck sign. And really mm -hmm. what you've got when you actually do the M mode, and this is really important. So you your M mode has to be in the right place. <laughs> so just showing you the image again. Sorry. I don't want the laser pointer for God's sakes. So you'll see sliding there with yeah. a B profile, but actually what you've basically got here is the baby breathing. This is not lung sliding and this is not lung pulse. This is just a baby breathing. And this is movement of the pleura <clears throat> that you see with the baby's breathing. And really what it does like over here, very classically, if you put your M mode in the right place, you have a transition of the seashore sign on the extreme left, but on the right, you've got transition to what is a barcode sign. And classically in the barcode sign is you've got these areas of waviness that you see. This area of waviness mm. basically that you see is the baby's breathing within the barcode sign, which is basically what is called Avicen's sign. So, you know, from our perspective, this is really... Uh, it's it's a right sided pneumothorax. Now, clearly, large or small, what do we think? Small. Let yeah. me make a guess. Small. Yeah. So, again, uh, if you wanted to confirm further, how else would we do it? So, we've got M mode, but really, what is really helpful is going back to that individual space. Yeah. Now, can you see sliding on the left, mm. but no sliding on the right with an A profile? Mm. That's your lung point in that individual space. It will probably extend down all the way. So really what I'm doing is I'm using every modality, uh, which is transverse and longitudinal scanning, my M mode to basically make the diagnosis, but I'm following a fixed structure. And there's a real risk that if I don't follow that fixed structure, I might miss a subtle pneumothorax in this baby, in a baby who's CPAP, who's in 40, 45% oxygen, probably has mm -hmm. transitioning lung, it's got TTN, we've got some lung points, some B lungs, but this could get worse. 
And if I kind of then report this and kind of say, well, it's normal, and I'm not doing a chest X-ray, this baby may end up with a tension pneumothorax on CPAP. Really, yeah. what we did in this situation is we decided to manage this conservatively, and we went on to Optiflow. Uh, and we just used Optiflow at about seven liters, you know, with a certain amount of oxygen, this baby improved. But what I want you to see is really the reporting and the medical legal consequences of it. So these are all R1. So this is R1. Is it R1? Naveen, is it R1? Yeah. Well, you have liver coming in. Oh, okay. So that has to be uh, at the it's, lower zone. Yeah, it is right lower zone. This is also right lower zone. Now, these basically both represent the right lower zone. This is clearly right lower zone, and I've labeled them all R1. But what I've also done is when wow. I did R3, I labeled that as R1 as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. And really, from my perspective, when we peer reviewed these images, everybody was very confused about whether there is an omothorax or not. Now, again, the risk with this kind of reporting and having images stored like this is if this baby goes on to develop a tension pneumothorax, I've labeled R3 as R1. I have reported mm -hmm. and I'll probably report that I think there's a right anterior pneumothorax, but people would then come and question that. Now, that is where I would say it's not just good enough to capture the images to make your clinical interpretation, really what you've got to do is you've got to label the images correctly as well. Because actually, if you look at the top of R1, and this is the top of R1, there's clearly an omothorax with a truck sign there and no proodle sliding with an M mode that actually shows very clearly that you've got a barcode sign. So there are real mm -hmm. risks based on reporting. And this is the image. It's a decent size omothorax. Now, mm -hmm. in certain units where they're using lung ultrasound, uh, they're not getting chest x-rays done. I know a lot of units in China, in Italy, and in Paris. And the risk then is that if you report it in that way, you can make mistakes with interpretation that can actually result in harm to the baby. Now, what is the best way to address this? And I'd like to say that we have done that with you throughout this course. And that is really first establishing that you've trained in a manner that allows you to be able to go through a progress which meets criteria that are internationally recognized. So we have used the BSPR recommendations of going through levels of training, which basically mean that you've got and had the didactic training, that you're now doing lung ultrasound, some of you independently, because you've got prior experience, you have more experience than uh, most trainers have. Some of you who have a middle level of experience, which you're consolidating on. And the expectation is that by going through this, you will at the end of the course, I'd say all of you will have achieved level three, but you will then have to practice scanning in your unit. And if you do that without uh, a proper format that actually establishes uh, that you are reporting consistently, that you are marking your images and using a standard uh, would not be appropriate. So if you're doing it and you haven't written your guidelines yet, I've given you one that you can use. But the important thing is that from here, you'd go on to progression, probably doing 50 scans by the time you've finished, uh, you know, writing the guideline on your unit. And the expectation would be that you have somebody who can peer review those images. For those of you who can't peer review those images, keep your Dropbox open and keep adding your images onto it. We will give you, by the end of this course, when you do your testing, uh, I would say a practitioner level uh, of certification, which says that you'll finish most of you if you've done, for me, if you've been able to demonstrate that you've done 20 scans, I'd be able to give you L3. And then if you keep populating your drop boxes, once you've achieved, I would say, the 50 scans, you've basically achieved L4 and you become an enhanced practitioner. And this basically satisfies the British Society of Pediatric Radiology recommendations. It satisfies the Australian Society of Ultrasound Medicine recommendations. And really what it does is you have your log with all the competencies, with all those images stored, which is basically proof of your competence. And that is crucial because if you now make an error and somebody comes back and says, well, how have you trained and what standard have you trained to? Well, you've got evidence for everything. 
And the reason I'm emphasizing this at this particular point is because when I migrated to the UAE, the first thing they asked me for was really a log of my images. They wanted to make sure that uh, it's not just a certificate. And I, I kid you not, any course that just gives you a certificate without the training, without the ability to do this point of care ultrasound properly is not doing you justice. Because actually a certificate, if you make a mistake, will not save you. Really what will save you is your training and the ability to demonstrate that training. Now those standards have been defined very well by the British Society of Pediatric Radiologists and are accepted by the Joint Royal Colleges of Training in the UK. They're also very similar to uh, the American uh, Radiology Association recommendations. And what they say is that once you've achieved level three, you're interested to kind of act with indirect supervision. Now, the challenge from your perspective, medical legally, is how do you keep that safe if I am not peer reviewing your scans and you don't have anybody to peer review your scans locally? And the answer to that is that you will get a chest X-ray alongside doing those scans because that is what will keep you safe because that is the standard of practice and the gold standard that is currently practiced on your unit. So for the purposes of going to level four and achieving a standard of credentialing, once you have done, say, 50 scans, you've got a good variety of pathology, you will develop the confidence to be able to start making decisions on your scans. And I would recommend that you continue doing chest x-rays where you feel they are appropriate. Because again, there will be images where you feel confused, where you might want to make therapeutic decisions. And I think that in those situations, getting a chest x-ray is not a sign of weakness. It's actually adjunctive evidence that your lung ultrasound is accurate. Now, in our unit, it's mandatory at the moment to get it done. I know that uh, uh, in Paris and certainly in Southampton, uh, we didn't. And, uh, you know, that was acceptable practice based on the guidelines over there. But more importantly, what you have to address is how you're going to store those images reporting. They must always be stored as loops. You need to be able to see sliding dynamic air bronchograms. You need to see dynamic loops to be able to define pathology, especially in all the areas. So that that's quite a bit. Because if you're doing a comprehensive scan, you're doing at least six images on the right, six images on the left with M modes for all of them, which is a further six, six, which is a total of 24 images. And then if you start doing horizontal or, or transfer scanning in each rib space, my dear, it, I, I've ended up doing 64 images on a baby recently. And they were very important because that baby had very patchy pneumonia which was only picked up when I went into each individual intercostal space properly. So it can be a lot of images that you have to store and report on. Uh, more importantly, from your perspective, once you've achieved that, it's not just about achieving that, it's about having ongoing training, quality assurance. And that is something again in the UK that we don't necessarily practice, but it's mandatory for us to practice over here in the UAE. Uh, again, I'm not sure that it, is entirely applicable in India, but I, again, it, it's good practice if you can have it. And I'm not saying that you have to achieve all of this. What you have to be able to achieve is guidance that makes sure that you're able to implement lung ultrasound in your units in a tenable, sustainable manner, which allows for you to have critique of your images. That might be another colleague, but has a governance framework that addresses issues where you might make a mistake. Now, when we talk about that governance framework, we need to talk about diagnostic and clinical error. And a simple example that I'd like to give you is uh, putting a chest strain in. So you can, with an X-ray, say which side the pneumothorax is by looking at the X-ray. And experience says that whenever I insert a drain, whether that's a pleural drain or, a, 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 you know, kind of for a pleural effusion or a drain for air, I will always bring the X-ray up. I will not actually put a, a drain in for a plural fluid without actually doing an ultrasound. Uh, for a pneumothorax, I will do an ultrasound where time permits, I will always get an X-ray done. Uh, but more importantly, uh, before I actually put the drain in, I will have that X-ray up on the system to make sure it's right side, right side, right patient, uh, and right approach. And uh, with an ultrasound, that's really challenging because when you do an ultrasound, you only have stored clips, you can't see both sides. So there's a real risk that if you label your images incorrectly and that you bring them up again. And 
this happens in situations where you've done the scan, you've wrongly labeled them, and it's somebody else who's putting that chest strain in where an X-ray has not been taken. So it has been reported in the literature, and I would say that you have to be extremely careful. When we talk about what I've spoken about so far, stages one to five, guidelines and SOPs will address that. But really, you must not forget identification of the baby site side confirmation of pathology. More importantly, what about comprehensive scans? Now, this is quite crucial. If you do not have a cause for your respiratory distress identified in anterolateral scanning, you have to do a comprehensive scan. If you're worried about a potential pneumonia, you're worried about potential for atelectasis in the posterior parts of the lung, you need to do a comprehensive scan. Anterolateral scanning really is limited to urgent diagnosis of a pneumothorax, very similar to the blue protocol, uh, or I would say lung ultrasound scoring for RDS. But for all other indications, you really have to do comprehensive scans. Now, how do you mitigate risk? Well, as I've said, you can use a chest X-ray, but more importantly, what we've demonstrated over here uh, is that Satish and Naveen were able to look at images and come to a conclusion together. So if you're really confused, take a second opinion, phone a friend. If you have another colleague who actually does lung ultrasound in the department, call him. If you have an experienced pediatric radiologist who's trained in lung ultrasound, ask them to review your images together. And really what I'd say is if you see anything that you can't recognize, get a chest X-ray. Always clinically correlate. And really, again, be very careful of just doing targeted lung ultrasounds, comprehensive lung ultrasounds are the way to go at this particular point of time, even if you have a pneumothorax. It also depends on the stability of the baby and the handling. You know, a 23-weeker where you're worried about RDS, anterolateral scanning, if you start doing comprehensive scans, 60 images, the amount of handling that you're going to give that baby is not going to be good for the baby. So really what I'd say is diagnostic error and clinical error can happen because you're either not following protocols, you're not implementing the training that you've got. And a good example that I'll give you is on the left side, you have the stomach and really you also have the spleen. Now, if you decide that you can't see the back wing sign and you feel that you can see what is uh, an A profile with dominant barcode sign, but there's no back wing sign, that could be the stomach. Now, because it's lateral and you see it quite far out, you might misinterpret that as being in L4 and you might decide that you want to stick a needle in that and that will not be good for the baby. But it will be because you haven't followed your guidelines in SOP. Again, if you mislabel your images, as I've just demonstrated to you, you really risk a drain going in the wrong side. But more importantly, if you're not using parallel scanning, there's a very good chance that you will miss a mnemonic consolidation in a baby who might have a high CRP. Again, you may well end up starting antibiotics, but this potential that that might become a, a bigger pneumonia, a collection. Now, to be honest, because you haven't done the image, it's missed. It's, it's risk to the baby as opposed to kind of medical legal risk for you. But it might be that you do the chest X-ray and the chest X-ray shows this patch that you've missed in that particular region. And then the question is, your colleagues will start questioning you about doing lung ultrasounds and kind of saying, well, you've done a lung ultrasound. Why haven't you been able to pick it up? It's more sensitive. It's more specific. So it then results in a group of people who then tend to disbelieve your skills and kind of think that you're a cowboy who's using lung ultrasound in your unit on your own without the actual skill. And that's where you have to be careful because credibility becomes quite important when you're trying to implement it. I had a question from Satish. Satish, go for it. Yeah, thanks, Alok. Um, it's regarding the M mode. Um, yeah. I know it's good practice to do the M mode, but is it absolutely um, mandatory and do you still do in all the zones in every scan you do? So what I'd say is that I will do M mode uh, for my longitudinal scans for every region, R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, R6. Uh, the challenge from my perspective is my system is a little bit more punitive than in the UK. I cannot take any risks. So for me, it's mandatory. What I would say is that, look, at the end of the day, very obvious sliding, I don't have any problems. Uh, you might decide that you're you know, an extremely preterm baby, literally going to take that particular image, which will cover R1 and R2 within one linear scan if you're using a, a linear probe. 
and you're just going to put your M mode in two areas and just quickly click those images. It doesn't take much time. So I would say that you can actually do all of the scans for the anterior lateral regions within literally 60 seconds with your M mode. You can review those images afterwards. But yeah, I would say that best practice is that you do the M mode for all regions. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that you go into each transfer space and start doing M mode. I think if you've confirmed that for a longitudinal area by putting your your M mode, uh, you know, in the entire region, that's good enough. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th thanks, Alok. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Now, what is very important about diagnostic and clinical error is the limitations of lung ultrasound. And this is where you have to be very careful. Lung ultrasound is not used to diagnose BIE. It's not used to diagnose non-cystic CPAMs. Uh, like if you have a cystic CPAM, again, the question from your perspective is you might get that cystic appearance, it might give you a message, but a lot of CPAMs are fluid filled and really you are not going to get much information because the lung ultrasound is not going to be able to demonstrate them. It's not really going to give you the etiology of pneumonia, viral versus bacterial. And while it might give you a hint as to transudative versus an exudative effusion, until you actually tap that effusion, you're not going to be able to kind of quantify its real nature. There is no high quality evidence that really defines volume of pneumothorax in neonates. There's no study that really looks at that, as well as the volume of pleural effusions. Most of the volume related kind of theory is, is extrapolation from adults. So just be very, very careful. I think when we talk about pleural effusions, We've already talked about pneumothorax. I will explain how we quantify site of the pleural effusion, the, the site of maximum kind of collection, and really linear dimensions work much better in those circumstances. A rough guesstimate of the pneumothorax, again, if you're doing anterior lateral scanning, is looking at where it is in relation to the axillary lines, anterior, mid, or posterior. Now, naturally, if it's all the way from the anterior part of uh, R1, R2, R3, R4 to the posterior axillary line, that's a large pneumothorax. But be aware that really you might have a problem with a pneumothorax that's originating, originating posteriorly. And sometimes in situations like that, you might have air, depending on the baby's position, if the baby is really left side down, that actually tends to localize to the, the right side up region. And if you then do an anterior scan with the baby left side down, that will change and that can really confuse your diagnosis. So my experience always is that when I'm doing a diagnostic kind of a, an ultrasound for a pneumothorax, I like the baby to be supine as far as possible and that I'm gonna do an anterior lateral scan if I want to quantify it. I've already spoken about the risk of a wrong side drain insertion. And if you mislabel your scans and somebody else is putting a drain in and you haven't had a chest X-ray, that is a very real possibility. Now, what I do want to say is that lung ultrasound gives you a lot of information. There is a huge amount of literature that justifies its use. There is institutional governance uh, that is in place that is now prescribed in the article by the American Academy of Pediatrics, by the European Society of Pediatric and Neonatal Intensive Care. And really what I would say is by international bodies, NeoFocus UK, the Cactus Group, all of which, which basically allow us to train uh, using good governance to be able to implement lung ultrasound as a diagnostic modality in our unit. But there are unit-specific needs that you need to identify. And that might mean that you don't have a linear probe or a hockey stick. That doesn't mean you can't do the lung ultrasound, as has been aptly demonstrated by our colleagues today. You can actually use different probes, but you might have to specify that in your guidance. And again, it's accepting the limitations of you might not be able to see subplural consolidations very well using a curvilinear C38 because actually it's a convex probe with a very low frequency, which will give you better depth. Now, the question is, you might be able to optimize that if you're able to change your focus to the level of the plura or by reducing your depth, as has been demonstrated today again. So you will need to define this in your guidance because really you're using a probe that might not give you the necessary images, but more importantly, it's really being able to implement that technology in practice. And this is where I would say to you that you mitigate your risk by gaining the skill. And for those of you who are working towards gaining the skill, if you practice and do and use the skill in a manner 
that uses clinical correlation, that uses the structured guidance of the batwing sign, looking for sliding, justifies the profile, looks at every region, does a comprehensive scan, and then looks at making a diagnosis through that, but asking for help if you're confused, mental modeling, then really my experience is you will rarely be lost. More importantly, you've always got chest x-ray as a backup. And during the training period and even afterwards, you know, if you feel that that's going to justify your use of lung ultrasound, make it easier, keep you protected, then use it. But also remember that there are some areas of evidence that don't necessarily endorse lung ultrasound as high quality uh, mm. kind of diagnosis, uh, uh, as mm. a high quality diagnostic tool. And really what I'd say is that that's very well espoused in the, the guidance for the European Society of Pediatric Neonatal Intensive Care. And that there's absolutely no doubt of its ability to diagnose and treat pneumothoraces, help with insertion of chest drains. In my mind, I, I don't think uh, you should actually be inserting a drain for effusion without ultrasound guidance. Uh, I, I think the risk is one day you will run into real trouble. Uh, I've just want to highlight one last thing. When you're practicing lung ultrasound in your unit, you might have colleagues who come and really ask you and say, well, you know, you're doing lung ultrasound, you've written your guideline. What if you make a mistake? Because really the question from your perspective is you're using a new diagnostic modality with, with you know, a training that from our perspective, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> has been obtained through a course. Now, the question that I would pose to them is, how did we learn how to do cranial ultrasound? How did we learn how to do uh, point of care neonatal echocardiography? It was through courses. It was through going through a process of peer review. It's through going through uh, you know, uh, a system of having guideline that really establishes our credentials. And that is how actually training occurs nationally, internationally. Uh, I think the most important aspect of it is when you get through this course, you will have evidence in the form of a logbook that will say that you've done 25 to 50 scans. Uh, you will have references, uh, very detailed references by the end of it, which basically talk about your ability, the quality of your scans, and the variety of your scans in terms of pathology. Something that is endorsed not just just by one individual myself, but by four other individuals who are also doing peer review as part of this. You will be able to reproduce that, that evidence in your institute. You will have a guideline that you will rigorously follow, that you will develop locally. But despite that, if you make a mistake, you must remember that you could make the same mistake with a chest X-ray. You can make the same mistake because of problems with a baby. Uh, and really that at the end of the day, when you do that procedure, if you follow all of this and do the procedure, you're doing it in good faith. And there are limitations of the actual diagnostic uh, modality itself, which is the case with chest X-ray. It can miss pneumonias. It can very much miss subtle pneumothoraces, which go on to develop tension pneumothoraces later on. We already know that chest X-ray, you know, from our perspective, does not pick up a significant amount of, uh, I would say, pathology because of the lack of its sensitivity, small effusion, say, for example. So really, I, I, I think there's enough in the literature to protect you, but what really protects you is the evidence of your training, the fact that you have developed guidelines, implemented them, and the most important thing is that you are actually putting that training into practice a certificate and doing the course. And I, I know that we have a lot of voyeurs on this course who go through the course actually not even looking at the lectures, but will give the test and will pass the test at the end because they are theoretically very capable. Take my word for it. You've wasted your time. You've wasted your money. It is not going to help you. And certainly from your perspective, you are at risk of making diagnostic and clinical errors, which in my mind is not good for the babies. That is my major take home message. Uh, just a few more things. What is really important is when you're performing lung ultrasound, that you have a clinical indication, that you're really looking at the indication for which you're doing it. Because the causes of respiratory distress at birth are very different to the causes of respiratory distress or acute collapse on a ventilator, say, for example. You're thinking of completely different differential diagnosis. But more importantly, what you really need to have is criteria that 
identify how you're going to implement this. And there are different protocols. So there is the safer protocol, which Nadia will talk to you about. There's the blue protocol that I will talk to you about. And really by espousing those protocols and following them, you keep yourself protected. But having a structured mechanism of why you're doing the scan, the need for whether it's comprehensive or targeted, sticking to that structure of the battering science, sliding the profile, always examine all zones if you have not got an answer to your question. Make sure that if you're confused, you phone a friend, clinically correlate before the diagnosis and mentally model. And my experience is you will rarely be wrong. I think the most important thing is when you feel that you find something that you can't explain or where you're confused, get another colleague to look at the scans, especially if you decide that you, you want to use that scan for a management decision. Back it up with a chest X-ray if you're confused. Use two adjunctive kind of diagnostic ways. More importantly, don't hesitate to make mistakes which are picked up in peer review. That's a learning process. And my experience is, you know, there are always situations where I show my scans and people kind of can't agree or disagree on really whether is there sliding or not? Do you think there's a subtle air bubble over there? You know, is there a small pneumothorax? And the question I'm really asking is, well, if the baby had deteriorated, I would have repeated the scan. Or if I'm not there, I would have had a chest x-ray. So really, I have put in a process that really keeps me safe in those circumstances. But if it's a small bubble and we can't see sliding and we're still confused about the M mode, then really those small bubbles in my experience, 99% of them resolve and the babies remain stable. In the occasional baby where the baby gets worse and there was a bubble, we have a backup plan. We've left a plan in place. This is just a really good algorithm by Curipa, which talks about that protocol which basically says batwing sign, lung sliding, what kind of profile you found, and then basically looks at the different diagnosis by, by, by ruling in those different signs. It's, it's beautiful. And we've incorporated this in our protocol over here in, for implementation of the Corniche. Again, this is just another example of the blue protocol. Uh, it's a very similar kind of a, uh, an addition that's used in adults. Uh, but the safer protocol Nadia will talk about I'm gonna end by very quickly going through two cases, which really are very nice cases. So uh, Anne uh, has left, unfortunately, she was on duty. Uh, Shruti, are you able to go through this case? Yeah, sure. Lovely, okay. So this is a 34 weeker with respiratory distress on CPAP at three hours of age. Uh, it was an elective cesarean. Uh, the baby basically, mother's not had steroids, uh, uh, came in. The baby is delivered with this presentation uh, by elective cesarean because uh, there was quite a prolonged labor, uh, failure to progress. Uh, the baby's basically had a gas with a pH of 7.2 and a CO2 of about 60, uh, is in about 30% oxygen. And this is a scan, as I said, at a few hours of age. Okay. So the right anterior upper, I can see the batswing sign. Beautiful. And then the pleura, I can see the continuity on the right half of the side. I can see that, uh, you know, it is sliding. On the left side, I'm not sure, like, you know, probably it's a bit doubtful whether there is lung sliding or not. Beautiful. Okay. And then there are some B lines on the right side. I don't appreciate the B lines on the left. Uh, okay. So I think we need the, the mode there. Okay, beautiful. Very good. Uh, I've just magnified the image over here to give you a little bit more. So anything else that you want to comment on? Um, like I think the plural sliding, this thing becomes more clear okay. here. That there is no sl sliding. Okay, there's no sliding. Uh, what about possibly a truck sign? Yeah, yeah, I can see the mirroring of the uh, ribs. Okay, so, okay, let's see. So we want M mode. Now this is M mode. What do we think? Okay, so M mode, this is, here this looks like there is, um, that looks like, See show to me on what we're seeing. Okay. Any comments about this M mode? 
i think the placing of the very good very good so this is really important it's i placed it in the area of sliding what we really need to do is place the m mode in the region where there's no sliding now it might be something as subtle as this you might be keeping the m mode at the lung point and you might not keep it at the region where there's no sliding and decide that you can actually see a seashore sign and really from our perspective unless you keep it in that right region you're going to land up into trouble so yeah this is just the same area now what i've done is i've just moved the cursor now what do you think now um, yeah so we can see the um, barcode sign and in between i think that um, you said that vertical things no yeah. because of the movement what we yeah. can see so it's avacens sign so you can see a barcode sign and this is important that really because of the breathing of the baby you sometimes get these small areas of dodginess between the barcode sign so just again a really good example comparing them side by side yeah so can you see <laughs> seashore versus barcode sign yeah it can be really subtle sometimes so you have to compare them side by side because it can be a real challenge but really what you've identified is the lung point in the right anterior mm -hmm. upper region now this is the chest x ray <clears throat> yeah like in the chest x ray it doesn't look like any obvious pneumothorax okay so you appear reviewing uh, and one of your colleagues comes back and comes back and says well you didn't pick up a pneumothorax um in the ultrasound no yeah that you were wrong yeah like it might be a small pneumothorax maybe which was not picked up in the x-ray as well like it's not that obvious in the x-ray as well so that's where you have to quote the literature and talk about the sensitivity of lung ultrasound but more importantly from your perspective this x-ray was actually done after about 90 minutes by the time radiology came and did it now it's a very small right anterior upper it's it's what we call an air bubble basically and that air bubble basically can resolve very quickly. But more importantly, can you see how sharp this border looks? You've got what is a residual sail sign. Yeah. So, you know, every potential that there was a small air leak there that has resolved. So again, you must realize that lung ultrasound has a much higher sensitivity and might actually give you information that might not retrospectively, prospectively be demonstrated by the chest X-ray. What about this case? So again, uh, 25 weaker elective cesarean, eight hours of age on conventional ventilation, quite significant work of breathing, and the baby now has acutely deteriorated and has SATs of 60% and 90% FiO2. It's very tachycardic. We have reduced right sided air entry. Okay. So, we have, like clinical examination, we have done. So, we're going to get the X ray done and we'll do a lung. Anything that you want to do before that that'll help your diagnosis? And uh, cold light? Yeah, I would cold light. I would always cold light in this situation. Let's see what you find. So R1, R2. This is because it's such a small baby. We've got virtually the whole of R1 and R2. Just the upper three ribs are missing. What do we think? So we can see the bat swing sign continuity of the pleura can be seen and I can see the A lines but the pleural uh, sliding I think it is reduced. Can you see any sliding? Uh, I don't see any sliding here. Yeah. And, what is this here? What is happening over here? Uh, in which uh, the first one? Yeah. I uh, this area is that a collapse? I don't know. Uh, so it's just a little bit of lung pulse. Yeah, Transmitted okay. pulsations from this is the right side coming from the heart. Okay. But really, I would agree no sliding A prime profile. What about this is basically going towards R3? Yeah. So here as well, I don't think that I can see the moment with the baby's breathing, I think, but yeah, I don't Very think good. there is. 
sliding. Do you think there is sliding or not? No, no, I don't think there is any lung sliding. Okay, let's get somebody to help you. Anybody mm -hmm. else? Avinash? So, um, in the right image, there is uh, a profile. You can see the A-lines nicely. Uh, the pleura is continu continuous. I can, uh, you can you can see it clearly delineated, but, uh, and there is some comet tails appearing uh, there. Um, definitely, there is some sliding compared to the first slide in the, uh, in the right upper. Uh, the, the, the first one, there was no uh, sliding and this one, there looks like there is some sliding. Yeah, very good. So the reason it's difficult, and Sh Shruti, I've given you a hard one. Basically, what has happened is this baby is oscillated. Yeah, Actually, I can see. So, so because he's oscillated, can you see the? Can you see that movement there? It's very rapid. Now, now one second, look, I can see the uh, comet. So, uh, I'm just showing to you how subtle it can sometimes be, and with oscillation, it can be really challenging. Again, you're going to use M mode, but like I said, M mode showed uh, a very nice seashore sign. But if I'm confused, I'll just go into that space, and can you see the sliding there? That's basically each one individual intercostal space, you can see plural sliding very nicely. Mm -hmm. But really, in this particular situation, as the baby breathes, again, it's just to say that sometimes you can see a truck sign and it's not indicative of a pneumothorax. Here again, you can see sliding, but the baby's oscillated. So these are just different planes in which I'm doing the ultrasound. This is really what I'd say is... Uh, lower down towards the back posterior axillary line and this is the lateral region mid axillary line and there's sliding in both of them but there's no sliding in the right superior upper region which is r1 basically so there is basically a pneumothorax now the key thing from my perspective is we treated this baby by an anal thoracentesis because of the acute deterioration small baby with a significant air leak and the baby improved I suspect there was an element of pulmonary hypertension as well, but most of the lung looks well aerated. You know, a lot of people would ask, ask should, do we need another dose of surfactant? Do you need another dose of surfactant? No. It's well aerated lung. So there's so much more information that you get from the lung ultrasound, but we made the right decision here. Now I'm going to show you the next case. Okay. So this was a term baby, normal vaginal delivery. This was a crash call from the midwife. Uh, basically, the baby was apneic, uh, was bradycardic, was having had inflation breaths, uh, was not breathing, blue as a, you know, sky. Uh, we basically gave this baby further ventilation breaths because the chest was moving, but the baby remained bradycardic, heart rate of 90 to 100 with SATs of 50 to 60. So it was intubated with some improvement, heart rate improved. Uh, SATs remained quite low, 60 to 70. So about 20 minutes of age, the baby was transferred to the neonatal unit. On examination, there was reduced right-sided air entry, reduced chest wall movement. We were on high pressures in 100%. What would you like to do? Get a cool light done and then get the X-ray and done. Okay, okay very good. Uh, so he's bradycardic. Okay. Yeah, like... Cold light is airway. negative. Yeah. Cold light is negative. Okay, the tube position. Uh, good, excellent. It was good. So, three kilo baby, nine at the lips, weight plus six. Okay. So, then get an ultrasound and... He's bradycardic. It's going to take a little bit of time. What do we think? Okay, I'm going to open this to the group. What does everybody want to do? We can plan for an echo. That's a ultrasound. It will take time. a long time. He's bradycardic okay. and desaturating in 100%. I'm just curious. What does the group want to do? Anybody? Translumination is negative. But it's not CDH or something. I don't ah, okay. What do we find? Uh, these are intestinal uh, yes, loops. Right. 
with those intestinal loops. It's a postnatal diaphragmatic hernia. Now, this is where you have to be careful. Uh, some people with this presentation might not hesitate to empirically needle without a chest x-ray because your baby is bradycardic. And really the risk of that is you might end up with a pneumothorax. You might end up with bowel perforation. You know, it's the right side. It's pretty high, actually. You know, R1, you're seeing bowel all the way up there with lung that's pretty collapsed. It's a postnatal diagnosis. So really a lung ultrasound very quickly confirmed that this was a diaphragmatic hernia. And really what we needed was higher pressure. And once we had higher pressure, really this baby basically recruited, the heart rate improved. You know, we had a heart rate of about 100. So it's not a really urgent situation where I, I think of putting a needle in, but actually just putting a probe on that right side really helps make the diagnosis. Does it? Anybody? As clinical background, the same yeah. the same patient could be yeah, without snort, be a hernia, could be a collapsed or total collapsed lung, yep. or or massive effusion. Yep. And really what I'd say is where time permits, I think if the baby's stable enough and you're waiting for a chest x-ray, you can put and do a lung ultrasound very quickly within two minutes. Mm -hmm. Just make sure it's a comprehensive scan. The reason I say that is what if you have a left-sided pneumothorax? So just to give you a feel, uh, just because I know it's been a long day, this baby had a left-sided pneumothorax. So this hernia was not the reason. Actually, this baby had a left-sided pneumothorax. And we ended up putting a pigtail on the left side. So I was trying to see whether anybody decides that we need a comprehensive, you must do a comprehensive scan. Just assuming that this is a diaphragmatic hernia and it explains everything is not is not enough. You need to make sure that you've scanned all regions before you make your diagnosis. And really, in this situation, you might decide that I've done the right side. It's a diaphragmatic hernia. The left side's getting worse. And really, what happens is on the x-ray, you then pick up a massive tension with the in the normal lung. The mortality in a diaphragmatic hernia, if you, you, know, you, you burst the normal lung, it's very, very high. So again, just be aware. This is how you run into complications with incomplete scanning, not following protocols. And it has, you know, it can have medical legal consequences, especially in the setup where I work. I'm just going to end by saying that actually, if you look at point of care ultrasound and medical legal cases that have gone to court in multiple different countries, the most common reasons that were implicated in are being wrong were really issues with diagnostic error, inc incorrect sonographic approach, you know, deficient, incomplete assessments. But poor skill accounted for very, you know, very few cases. Really, the most important reason is the failure to perform point-of-care ultrasound where it was indicated. Now, for, for units that are practicing point-of-care ultrasound where everybody is doing it, you would argue that actually, if a, a chest x-ray had been taken, and you had just relied on this being uh, the reason. You'd done only the right and not the left side. Well, and the baby dies. And on postmortem, they pick up a massive left-sided tension pneumothorax. Then you'll get in trouble because actually point-of-care ultrasound could actually pick that up. A chest x-ray would have taken much longer. I mean, the baby might actually have died before that. So again, there are precedents in the literature where it basically shows that's the failure to perform point of care ultrasound where it was actually clinically indicated, which is the most common reason for why people get sued in America and Canada. Uh, actual other reasons like diagnostic error and incorrect sonographic approach form a minority of the cases. Inadequate skill, actually, it's a fraction. Only two cases, two to three cases out of 15. You know, so... I just want to reassure you that if you're really diligently practicing and performing your scans to the best of your ability, you're doing a good job. You're using clinical correlation and you're using the guidelines as we've taught them. It's very unlikely that you will be wrong. I think it's just making sure that you work within your limitations. Any questions? Sorry, this was a very long talk. I apologize. Any questions? I think to be safe should be do scan both lungs at the same time and don't rely only one when one lung 
should be make comprehensive scans yeah 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 i would agree that in the majority of cases you should be doing comprehensive scans i think the only exceptions that i've talked about are extremely preterm babies i think you just have to be a little bit careful again it's clinical context if i've got a baby who say is fio2 is just starting to rise it's going up from 35 to 45% and i'm thinking of a second dose of surfactant you know i might do a brat score again but the question from my perspective is if he's gone up from 35 to 60 70% i need to make sure that i'm ruling out a pneumothorax that will also be confirmed by an anterolateral scan now if i do an anterolateral scan and actually i can find neither evidence of good going rds the lung is well aerated and there's no evidence of a pneumothorax the question is is there atelectasis i am then going to complete this by doing a comprehensive scan but if i find an anterior air leak and i i would argue that you need to do both right and left anterolateral reasons i might decide to treat that first it's all about going case by case more or less i would say that i i think you'd end up having to do comprehensive scans but scanning each individual into costal space transfer scanning in an extremely preterm 23 or a 24 weeker is a huge amount of handling i i just be cautious about that any other questions uh dr ala could you explain these few signs maybe in the next class like that okay well, sign and avicen sign yeah we'll we'll talk about uh, them we'll talk about uh, them yeah there the i'd say the very minor and not really relevant but we'll talk about them okay anything else thank you god bless you all thank you have a good thank day you. thank you for your thank you. stamina and patience thanks a lot yeah. thank you thank you